Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Calvary Chacopole Eagle. I invite you guys to come on in, and if you'll stand as we open with worship this morning. <coughs> Dear Heavenly Father, we just come before you because you are so good. Lord, we're so thankful for your word. We're so thankful for your ways. Lord, you are perfect. You are the mighty God. And we come before you this morning to worship you, to lift you up. And we pray, Lord, that you would be glorified in this place. Lord, let us lay our weeks, let us lay our mornings at your feet and allow you to wash over us, Lord, that we would be renewed and refreshed for having been in your presence and been with your people, Lord. We love you, we worship you, and we give you this time in Jesus' name. Amen. In my wrestling, in my doubts, in my failures, you won't walk out. Your great love will lead me through. You are my peace in the troubled sea. Oh, you are my peace in the troubled sea. In the silence, you won't let go. In the questions, you're too.
that you would cause us to learn to be still before you, Lord. That this would be the cry of our hearts, Lord. That we would wait upon you. That we would seek you. You are the everlasting God. The God of this universe, Lord. May we give you all the praise and glory that's due your name. In Jesus' name. We like to teach you a new song this morning. It's called Rooftops.
trust you. We give our lives to you. We lay our lives at your feet because you are our God. You are our Father in heaven, Lord. And we lay our lives before you. We worship you, Lord. So I shout out your name from the rooftops I proclaim that I am yours I am yours All that I am I place into your loving hands and I am yours You're welcome to be seated at this time. You're also welcome to remain standing.
you are great and you are mighty. We worship you this morning. We lift you up. We give you all the praise and glory that's due your name, Lord. Because you are our creator. You have given us life. And we owe everything to you, Lord. We worship you, Lord. We give you our lives. Lord, we pray this morning that you would have your way in us, Lord. Lord, you give us ears to hear your voice. Lord, that you would show us those areas you want us to lay at your feet, the ways that you want to make us more like you, Lord. Give us ears to hear and hearts that are willing to listen. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll go ahead and take this time to say hello to someone sitting near you.
Good morning. Good morning. How are you guys? Good. Today, I'm Seth, in case you guys don't know. Um, in the announcements today, the serving seniors, the Tim and Marilyn Nagel, they go out to a assisted living home and uh, do a church service there. That is today. If you'd like to help, um, you have to find Mr. Tim, wherever he is. I can't see him. All right, the next one is the, our midweek Bible study. We meet every week uh, on Wednesdays from 6.30 to 8-ish. Uh, that is at the Eagle Senior Center off of State. So love to have you guys come there. We uh, worship, study the Bible, and uh, have some, like a potluck style dinner so you guys feel free to come uh the church is looking for people with medical training or cpr training we're trying to uh, make a plan in case of emergency so if you have that training um there's a sign up sheet in the foyer area and we'll get back to you on that also, it looks like our children's ministry is in need of uh, helpers and teachers. So, if you feel called to that, there's a sign-up sheet for that, too. Yeah. Um, also, the youth, high schoolers, um, we are challenging you guys to step up and start uh, helping out in areas. So step out of your comfort zone, because it's good for you. Um, next Sunday is the Power and Prayer, and that's at in, uh, Mount Star. So that will be next Sunday, and we have church online directory. If you don't know, passwords in there. It's Romans 8.28, sorry. Um, what's the next one? Um, if you're visiting today, there's visitor packets out there. And um, after service, if you need prayer, there's a prayer team right there. So have a good day. I know that the youth ministry is waiting to be dismissed, but let me just tell you something. If Seth can do it, you can do it, right? Um, one of the things I've heard from our, our ushers and our greeters is that 
it was just one of the most wonderful experiences in the world when our junior high, uh, we assigned them to do it, so it wasn't a volunteer thing, and then eventually they liked it. But, but the junior hires were the greeters and ushers for one Sunday, remember when we did that fundraiser? It was a wonderful thing. So high school, before I dismiss you, I want to make sure you're paying attention because some of them are still passing notes. I want to let you know we'd love to have you volunteer for ushers and greeters and even door to door. Matter of fact, Seth and his brothers come door to door with me. They've actually they've been doing it more without me sometimes. Uh, but we all meet at the at the subway. And if you're nervous about that, I'm not going door to door. You're not making me do it. We have a rule, by the way. Any of you guys, old or young, who want to go door to door with us, one of the rules is you you don't talk for the first couple times you even go out there because we want you to just observe and stand by us and pray. It's not like, what do I say once they open the door? <laughs> you don't have to say anything. We, we've got trained people who can do the talking. It'd just be nice to have you come along and maybe let the fire start burning. And stuff. You know, when I started going door to door, I was a pastor and it, I was nervous. I'm going door to door with the team and as a pastor I'm going, oh my gosh, I got a neck in the door and a stranger. And, and by the third or fourth house, of course, because of my personality, by the third or fourth house, I'm going, could I take the next one? You know, so it, we wait until you want to do it, okay? So anyway, youth, you're dismissed. Have fun. Is, Josh, you're here, right? Good, there he is. Your fearless leader is right to your right on the way out the door. He's not going to let you sneak out, okay? <clears throat> All right, the rest of you, why don't you uh, open your Bibles with me to Acts chapter 16, and uh, we're continuing, we're moving right along in Acts, and actually the, the action just keeps, keeps moving, it keeps picking up here. Acts chapter 16, if you've looked at the title already, you realize that it's kind of an odd title. It might make you a little suspicious if, you're, if you have discernment. You go, the spirits communicate? Really? What's he going to do? Have a clairvoyant meeting today? Uh, actually, we're going to look at a clairvoyant situation and we're going to see what the Bible says about it. We're going to see how the apostles handled it. Hopefully, if you've been involved with spiritual things outside of Christianity, your ears will perk up. You'll be going, well, wait a second. There are things that are spiritual that are not good. There are things that are spiritual that are um, the wrong kind of spirit. And that's what we're going to see today because we're going to hear from two different spirits today, believe it or not, because... <clears throat> The, um, the Holy Spirit, and then we'll even see an instance of the, a demonic spirit speaking. And each, you're going to find each are very different, each are very distinct, and, and uh, each spirit, by the way, does communicate. You look at verse 6, you look at verse 16 and 17, we're going to look more in depth at that. But spirits communicate. The Holy Spirit communicates, evil spirits communicate. Communicate. By the way, if you want to look more in depth, I put a whole list of scriptures in your shepherd or sheep. You can do some homework on that. But let me tell you right now, right up front, that one spirit you should heed and listen to. But there's other spirits you need to learn to recognize and reject. And so I'm wondering, and don't have to answer out loud, but have you ever heard from spirits besides the Holy Spirit? Have you ever heard from the Holy Spirit? I'm hoping you could all... <coughs> Sometimes I choke myself up. <laughs> Hopefully, if I had a show of hands, most of you could say you've heard <clears throat> from the Holy Spirit. So a little review up to this point. The Apostle Paul has launched out on his second missionary journey. And after the, we looked at a little split between him and Barnabas, Paul and uh, Barnabas and, and Mark went one direction, Paul and Silas went another. If you remember, the Holy Spirit specifically said, separate Saul and Barnabas. They have a, a mission for them. The Holy Spirit put them together. And yet a, a, a conflict within split them apart. And yet the Lord kept working. We looked at that. We'll continue to look at how the Lord uses even our weaknesses. Even when things go wrong, the Lord uses those things. Um, so we, we saw that happen in the end of chapter 15, verse 37 through 41. But interesting, from this point on in the book of Acts, we're going to be following Paul and his companions, whether it's Silas or Timothy, whoever he's with, the, the, the book of Acts specifically follows Paul. Now, let me, I'll give you a little spoiler alert. Why? Because the author of Acts is, who knows? Luke. 
And Luke, in today's study, we're going to see that in Paul's journeys, Paul picks up Luke along the way. And so, of course, it would be quite natural that Luke, uh, as he's writing the book of Acts, he's going to be following Paul, and it doesn't mean that Barnabas and Mark don't count, okay? So, Father, we just give this time to you. We pray that you speak to us. Open our hearts to hear what you have to say to us. Lord, only you know what we each need to hear. And Father, I may have prepared notes and prepared my message, but Lord, I pray that you've prepared hearts and open ears, that we'd hear personally from you, not just a prepared or canned message, but Lord, use your word to speak personally to each one here today. And Lord, I pray that those who are away from you would be drawn near. I pray that those who are in sin would come to repentance. I pray that those who are confused would have clarity. And so, Lord, speak what we need to hear. Only you know each heart. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're Acts chapter 16, verse 1. And I want to start by putting the map up, if you got that, because uh, I don't know about you, but I need a visual. You know, I've been through Bible studies all my life, and I've heard people explain things, and I still don't get it. Show me a picture. You don't even have to talk. Now I see, okay? So as we put the map up, it says that, speaking of Paul, he came to Derby and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy. So we're, we're starting out on this journey looking at, and we're going to look at zooming in and out of this map in a moment, and we're going to look at different parts of the world. So I've got several maps for you today. I'm excited. I like pictures. Uh, so uh, what, remember what the original plan was. They're, to, they're revisiting the cities that they once preach the gospel in, and now there are churches in these cities. And not only are they revisiting, but you think, well, they, you know, he should do that. But, you know, I, I found out during my study that it was, most commentators estimate it was a good five years since Paul's been there. So here these churches have been established. Could you imagine somebody comes by, evangelist comes by and preaches the gospel to you, and you and a few friends receive Christ, and you start meeting, and you don't hear from that evangelist again, or apostle, actually in five years. How are they going to survive? Will they survive? Well, God's bigger than all that, and the Holy Spirit kept them together, and Paul found healthy churches in each one of these cities, even some of the cities that he was persecuted in, was run out of. So it just shows the work of God. It wasn't because they had great organizational skills. It wasn't because, well, the way our denomination does it, we know how to plant a church, and we, we have follow-up programs. And we, you know, the Holy Spirit's the follow-up program, okay? And when we go door to door and when we share the gospel, we give out tracts. It's impossible to follow up on everybody you share the gospel with, especially if you're sharing the gospel a lot. And yet, the Holy Spirit is the perfect follow-up program. And uh, I, I trust in Him. You know, I mean, a lot of people, there were times when people ask me, what's your, what's your plan for, for Calvary Chapel Eagle? Well, what's your six-week plan, your six-month plan, your six-year plan? And I just go... Well, we study the Word, we worship God, and we share the Gospel, and we just do what the Bible tells us to do. We trust that God does His job. And you know what? He does. Anyway, I wasn't planning on getting off on that. But uh, So now, here we are five years later after Paul had visited these cities, and we meet Timothy, who's a young convert, who is, has be he will become one of the traveling companions of Paul, and will have a, a discipleship ministry or mentoring situation where Paul will take Timothy under his wing. Later, Timothy will become a pastor, and that's where, if you later on in your Bible, you'll see First and Second Timothy are written to Timothy by Paul, and it's some great advice in there. If you want to learn about ministry, what are some principles of ministry, what some advice Paul would give to a pastor, he wrote it all to Timothy. Those are the, matter of fact, they're called the pastoral epistles, First and Second Timothy and Titus. And so if you want to learn about that, make a note of that right now, and you could go back to it. <clears throat> so, great advice. Timothy, by the way, means honoring God, and he certainly did it with his life, and so it's a good thing. It's a fitting name. A little bit more background as we look at verse 1 and continue to read. It says, Timothy was the son of a certain Jewish woman who believed, but his father was Greek, and he was well spoken of by the brethren who were at Lystra and Iconium. Now, if you look at the map, uh, this was spread out. He had a good reputation, not just in the city he lived in, but Timothy 
gained a name for himself. He had a good reputation beyond the borders of his own little hometown. And so because of this, Paul took notice. He says, you know what? You're a good prospect for maybe the Lord's calling you to ministry. Maybe the Lord's calling you to be a pastor. Why don't you travel with me? I want to get to know you. I want you to get to know me. I want to rub off on you. That's what discipleship is all about. And it says he had a good reputation. By the way, I don't know if you realize this. Unfortunately, today, there's a, some ministry people don't have a good reputation. According to the pastoral epistles I just told you about, a good reputation is one of the requirements for ministry. If you're going to be a pastor, you don't pick the guy who, yeah, he, let's, let's pick Joe over here. He, remember, I, I, I knew him when he ripped me off by selling me that broken car, you know. Y you want to have somebody who's trustworthy and loyal. So, as a matter of fact, in 1 Timothy chapter 3 in the pastoral epistles, verse 7, uh, Paul says, look, when you've set up people who are going to be in ministry, he must have a good reputation with outsiders. You know, sometimes people have a good reputation in the church, but in the business world, they've made a bad name for himself. If you want to be used by God, you really need to have, not just fool the people in the church. It's Sorry, but it's easier to fool the people in the church. It really is, because you, you're on your best behavior at church, and everybody goes, oh, yeah, good guy. You don't know how he does business practices. You don't know how his family, how he treats his wife and his kids. Those are all important. They're important factors of somebody who's in ministry. It's got to be somebody you can trust. Watch how he watches his, his, treats his kids and his, his wife and, and the, his, how he conducts business. And so anyway, I thought I'd throw that out at you if you feel calling in your life. It's not just how well you talk. You know, talk is cheap. Verse 3, anyway, Paul wanted to have Timothy go on with him, and he took him and he circumcised him because of the Jews who were at that region, for they all knew that his father was Greek. Stop! You remember what we talked about last week? They took Timothy and circumcised him. Remember what we talked about last week? Last week, the big deal was, the last couple of weeks, the big deal was the, the real religious Jews were saying, if you want to be a Christian, you have to get circumcised, and you have to follow the laws of Moses. You have to be a, pretty much become a Jew before you can become a Christian. And that was a big council in Jerusalem. They hammered it all out, and the, and the conclusion was, no, you don't have to be circumcised to be a Christian. What's going on here? Is this high hypocrisy with Paul? Well, we're going to talk a little bit today about taking higher ground. Sometimes it costs. Sometimes it hurts. <laughs> and, and, and it looks problematic here. But I want you to remember what the big controversy in, in Acts chapter 15 was and, and what happened there. But, but last week I told you that there are some things that Christians might have to give up so that they don't stumble others. Remember we talked about certain foods, uh, going certain places. We talked about how sometimes uh, drinking alcohol fits into that or smoking. There's some things that you might think there's nothing wrong with, but in order to be a better witness to people around you, and there may be nothing wrong with it, by the way. There are some things that there's nothing wrong with it, but I've given it up so that I can reach others for Christ because I don't want to stumble them. We've talked a little bit last week about that, but now I want to talk to you this week about doing things that you normally wouldn't do in order to win those who, who you want to bring to Christ. Um, you know, there are times we give up or avoid things that are not wrong or sinful so that we don't stumble others. But here, if you're taking notes, if you're using the inserts, your first fill-in is this. Christians should always take the higher ground. You've heard me say this before if you've been sitting in church very long with me because I think that we need to take the higher ground. And, and, and by the way, how do you know who should, who should take the higher ground? You should take the higher ground, not me. Well, I'll tell you what. The more mature Christian should take the higher ground. If you're around people and you're stumbling them by the liberties that you have, the things that you think it's okay or you know is okay to do, but it's stumbling those around you, well, they need to get over it. No, you as the more mature person should step up and make more sacrifice because I think the mature person is, re is responsible to make a sacrifice. So here's a picture of a Christian doing something that he really doesn't have to do in order to win some to Christ. Uh, I remember a, a time when 
uh, back in California many years ago when there was the, the Beirut war going on, and it's all foggy to me, I hardly even remember it. I just remember one thing that stood out to me. My pastor at the time was a hippie. Well, he was a hippie. Maybe at the time he's kind of grown out of it, but he still had this big black beard. And uh, we called him Blackbeard. We didn't really call him Blackbeard. He was, he was a, 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 you know, a, a on fire Christian, pastor, great preacher. And he was traveling in the Middle East and he was going into Beirut and he had this great big black beard and he had it as long as I've known him. But the brother traveling with him says, look, we're going into a town to minister to the Christians who are living under persecution. They're living underground. And the only people who have big full beards of the jihadists and the, the Muslims, the Christians are all clean shaven. Just letting you know. I'm just saying. So guess what Pastor Jeff did? He shaved his beard. Well, he's always had that beard. You don't have to shave the beard. The Bible doesn't say you have to shave your beard. You can make all kinds of arguments, but you know what? He took the higher ground. And boy, we were shocked when he came home. <laughs> Who that? You know? But I'm telling you, that, that, that's the kind of mentality that an unfired Christian who wants to serve the Lord should have, is that we take the higher ground and we make sacrifices. And here's your next fill-in. A Christian who wants to bring people to Christ will sometimes do things that he doesn't have to do. Huh? I'm just telling you, I'm not putting laws or legalism on you because we dealt with legalism the last two weeks. But there's times I will sacrifice things I have to sacrifice. There's times I do things I don't have to do in order to win some to Christ. Here's the second part of that. A Christian who wants to bring people to Christ will also sometimes avoid doing things that are not necessarily wrong. Huh? And last week we talked about, you know, if, if, if you're trying to witness to a bunch of former alcoholics, you don't meet them in a bar, right? I mean, you, you try to find things. Maybe there's nothing wrong with you having a beer, and you could make a biblical argument for it, but that's not how you get a witness to somebody who's trying to quit drinking and they're an alcoholic, right? And there, there's times you've got you to go the extra mile, and there's things you don't think are wrong, and they're not wrong. But you give up things. You take the higher ground, okay? So later in Galatians chapter 2, verse 3, Paul refuses even to circumcise Titus because he was a Gentile. He was not a Jew. So here's the thing. Right now, Timothy was raised by a Jewish mother. And it was actually kind of unacceptable that you're raised by a Jewish mother, be, I mean, before they were Christians. And he's a Jew, but he never got circumcised. And so he's going to try to go witness to the Jews. That's just modeling something wrong. Later, when, when Paul takes Titus around, where Titus is a Gentile, and they want to get him to circumcise, he refuses. So you just got to seek the Lord and know where to draw the line. So verse, we're back in chapter 16, verse 4, as they went through the cities and they delivered to them the decree to keep, which were determined by the apostles and the elders in Jerusalem, so the churches were strengthened in the faith and increased in number daily. And so here we go. Matter of fact, what's the decrees? The decrees that they're going out to preach are you don't have to be circumcised if you're a Gentile to become a Christian. You don't have to memorize and obey all the laws of Moses. It, and it set them free. Yet, to keep all the ducks in a row, Paul thought, look, I'm taking this Jewish boy along who got saved. Let's, let's have him circumcised. So uh, if you're taking notes, here's your next. Legalism produces bondage and oppression. We talked about that last week, but let me tell you something else. Grace produces strength and increase. And so they were preached, you know, the gospel of grace was preached to them. They knew they, they had liberties. They, they didn't have to come under the bondage of, of, of the laws of Moses or circumcision. And so it brought strength and increase. One more thing I want to say about um, Timothy being circumcised before we move on. And F.F. F. Bruce said this, by Jewish law, Timothy was a Jew because he was the son of a Jewish mother. But because he was uncircumcised, he was technically an apostate Jew. If Paul wished to maintain his links with the synagogues, he could not be seen to tolerate apostasy. So remember, one of Paul's methods when he'd go into a town, he'd go into a town, find out where the synagogue was, because he was not only a Jew, but he was a high-ranking Jew, and he'd go in there with all of his garb and his uniform that showed I'm, not, I'm a Pharisee, and not only that, I'm a, of the Sanhedrin, 
which was a high-ranking Jew, he'd go into these synagogues, and they'd recognize right away by his stripes, hey, what do you got to say, man? Here's a special guest, one of the Sanhedrin. We need to hear from him, and he'd preach the gospel. And if he's going to stay effective like that and bring a Jew boy along with, excuse me, that's a tacky, a Jewish young man, <clears throat> then he better have, make sure that he was circumcised. What, what, you know what? Let me cause trouble here. How did they know whether he was circumcised or not? <laughs> Do you have this card for that? Do you wear a wristband? Do you get a stamp? Anyway, I don't know. I don't have the answer to that one. I thought I'd stir the pot a little bit. Okay. <clears throat> I know they don't do a spot check when they go into the synagogue. <laughs> Just saying. Verse 6. When they had gone through Pergia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. Now, you might want to put, get that map back. There it is. Uh, because I need to see this, and you probably do too. They're, they're traveling along, and the Holy Spirit's telling them where not to go. In verse 7, after they'd gone to Mysia, they tried to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit him. That, that, there's, a, there's something good for you to talk about in your growth groups this week, because that leaves all kinds of questions. It goes on to say, So passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Paul's having his vision. In verse 10, after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. Okay. God says, don't go this way. Okay, how about this way? God says, don't go that way. Okay, where do we go? He gets a vision. Come to Macedonia. Donia, Donia. <laughs> and so he figured that's the way to go. Now, I know this brings up all kinds of questions, how the Lord spoke. But it's interesting that the Holy Spirit forbade them to go to the left or to the right. I was looking at that map, and it's interesting as they're going, it's the top blue line, not the bottom one. As they're going through there, uh, Bithynia is, is north, and, and Asia, or Asia Minor, it's not the Asia we know today, was, was south uh, or left. They could go to the right or to the left. Keep going. It's interesting. The Holy Spirit's directing them in this way. <clears throat> now, how did the Holy Spirit forbid them? Now, there's all kinds of crazy ideas out there. I mean, some people go, Paul must have got another relapse of his malaria, or he got really sick when he looked that way. It's like, we don't know. So I'm not going to tell you. We, can, we do know some various ways the Holy Spirit leads, and I'm going to give you some ideas. Uh, and, and by the way, I'm quoting from the New Living uh, Translation Study Bible notes, and I even use this for your uh, shepherd of sheep. It says that God's Spirit guided his servants in Acts in a variety of ways, including divine visions, direct intuition, counsel with other believers, guidance through prayer, insights through scripture, and even prophecy. Guidance by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit helped them to accomplish their mission to be Christ's witnesses. If you're a small group leader, you might want to take that shepherd of sheep back to your, your uh, growth group when you have a meeting because there's more verses if you want to explore and look that up and just kind of look at some examples there. But see, we're not told here specifically how the Holy Spirit forbade. We know how the Holy Spirit can guide. But I don't know. Have you ever had a time when the Holy Spirit told you not to do something? How do you describe that, you know? Sometimes it's just a gut feeling. Don't go there. Uh, <clears throat> David Gusek points out that Paul was guided by hindrance. The Holy Spirit often guides as much by closing the doors as he does by opening doors. David Livingston wanted to go to China, but God sent him to Africa. William Carey wanted to go to Polynesia, but God sent him to India. Adrian uh, Judson went to uh, India, but God guided him to Burma. God guides us along the way to just the right place. <clears throat> you know, and there's been times the Lord would stop me from doing something. I have no idea why, and sometimes you never find out why. You just, okay, Lord, I trust you with it. I planned on doing this, you shut the doors. Sometimes he's, he leads us by shutting the door. Now, but a couple things I do want to talk about <clears throat> is why. Why the Holy Spirit forbade, okay? Because you could jump to all the wrong conclusions with that one too. It's not because God didn't want those people saved. Don't go to Asia. I want them all to go to hell, right? That's not it at all because we know according to 1 Timothy 2.4, 
that God desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And eventually, God will send people to Asia, and eventually there'll be churches in Asia. We know from 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but all come to repentance. So don't ever think, well, God didn't send them there because God wants that whole nation to go to hell. That's not at all the heart of God, okay? Uh, we know the heart of God is to see people get saved. And, and I, my theory, this is my theory, it was a matter of timing. Only God knew maybe their hearts weren't ready or maybe there was a crisis right now in, in um, Macedonia where God's calling them. He, the man says, help us. Maybe there's something going on right now that the people in Macedonia were especially, their, their heart is especially fertile and ready to receive the gospel. That's why it's so important. We could make our plans, but Lord, help me to be willing to change my plans when you redirect me. Help us. You know, one of the things my wife and I pray often is, Lord, fill us with your spirit and help us to walk in the spirit. You could have the greatest plans in the world and it looks good on paper. But God has other plans. Are you flexible that you're willing to change your plans when the Lord makes it obvious? Because Paul was, okay? It was a matter of timing here. Only God knows each heart and what's going on. And later, by the way, later we see some very significant churches planted in Asia Minor. I got a, a PowerPoint for you of the seven churches of Revelation where Jesus spoke to each of the seven churches in, in the book of Revelation. You know that was seven churches in Asia well, right now, he's telling them not to go. So take a look at the map, get an idea for it. It's up there, right? Hate to say that when it's not there. Okay. And, but at this point, God was calling the Apostle Paul to think totally outside the box. What do you mean totally outside the box? Paul wasn't thinking big enough. God says, I know you want to reach the area all around Israel and Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond, but like, like Acts 1.8 says, but I want you to start some churches in another country and another continent. And, and so at this point, God's actually calling Paul and Silas to go to Europe. Could I see a map of Europe? Ta-da! There we go. But, I mean, this this a whole other ballgame. You know Europe? It's in the news all the time right now. You know there's some great cathedrals and churches established in Europe. And, and so that's interesting that God is saying, I have something outside the box. Are you open when God wants to call you outside your box, outside your comfort zone? You think, well, this far and no more. And God says, keep coming. I got something. I got something more for you to do. I got, think bigger. And you go, well, I've got a big plan, a big vision. I'm talking spiritually, not your, your wallet, okay? And God says, I got bigger for you. God wants to use you. You know, I've told you that so many times. God wants to use each of you, not just the pastor, not just the worship leader, not just the people with the badges or the pointy hats. God wants to use you. I've told you that. My job is to train you so that you can be usable and be used by God. So, now, by the way, one more odd thing that I find very strange is that we, we just saw that God gave Paul a vision of a man in Macedonia <clears throat> saying, come and help us. And then when Paul gets to Macedonia, he meets with a woman. Have you noticed that before? I mean, it's like, matter of fact, there is no, there is no synagogue in Macedonia, or in Philippi at least, or they would, there would have been uh, a synagogue. Uh, excuse me, they, there's no synagogue because there, was no, uh, there wasn't 10 Jewish men. One of the rules back then was if you have 10 Jewish men in a town, you need to have a synagogue. If you don't have 10 Jewish men, you can't have a synagogue, even if you have 20 Jewish women. Isn't that weird? A little unfair. I guess it wasn't America, right? But that, that was the custom of the time. And, and so there's a man calling in the vision, and all he finds is a bunch of women at a prayer meeting. When he shows up, we'll look at that in a moment. <clears throat> By the way, um, something else. This is just something I, I, I noticed that I think isn't significant. That in verse 9, this man is crying out, help us. He's crying for help. If you're taking notes, write this down. Look at the, look at the fill-in, by the way. This is a great picture of someone ready to receive the gospel. Somebody who knows he needs help. You ever try to help somebody who doesn't want to help? Leave them alone. You know what I mean? 
I mean, one of the big lessons I had to learn in life is don't give advice to people who aren't asking for your advice. Huh? I had to get some duct tape, you know. But there are people who want your help or want advice, and you can talk to them. Here's another fill-in. You won't go to the doctor if you don't think you're sick. You won't come to the Savior if you don't think you're a sinner. And so I think the best people to help are those who are saying, help. Huh? The best people to share the gospel with are people who know they're needy. They know they need, they need a Savior because they know that they're sinners. Sometimes the hardest people to reach are the, the famous and the wealthy, the healthy. I, I'm, I'm fine. That's okay. Find somebody else who needs your Jesus. I'm good. Those are hard people to reach. Or real religious people. Have you ever tried to share Jesus with somebody who's religious but lost? I've got my religion. Thank you. I'm fine. Well, you could take your religion to hell with you, you know. Don't tell them that. I mean, but the fact is they need Jesus. So verse 11. Therefore, sailing from Troas, we met a straight course to Samacro... Oh, I should have practiced this one. Samothrace. And the next day to Neapolis. You know, when I, when I first read these, they came right off my... They rolled off my lips. And then when I stand up in front of you, sometimes I freeze. But uh, so here there's a, a major change in the narrative of Acts. Before we read on, I want you to notice some. It says... Uh, therefore, sailing from Troas, we ran a straight course. Do you see that we? How come you didn't say, therefore, they? Because this is where Luke joins the party, the author of, of Acts. It's kind of, you only have to catch it. You could, you could miss that. But this is where Luke, the great physician, not the great physician, Jesus is, but he's famous as, as a physician. He joins them at this point, and he's the one who wrote the book of Acts. So from now on, you're going to see... Not just they, but you're going to say, then we did this, then we did that, because this is where Luke joins them. Uh, and by the way, David Gusek has an interesting insight on this. He says, now we see another reason why they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. We see another reason why the Spirit did not permit them to go to Bithynia. God wanted Paul and his team to go to Troas to pick up a doctor named Luke. Be because God said no to Paul in these two times, we have the gospel and the book of Acts written by Dr. Luke. It could very well be that if, if you're picking up what he's saying, is that if they would have gone to either of these other places, we wouldn't have the book of Acts today because he may not have picked up Luke and Luke was, was the scribe writing all down. It's kind of interesting. I'm, I'm thankful that the Holy Spirit says no because um, we've got a famous author you have to pick up in Troas, okay? <clears throat> so verse 11 again. It says, therefore, sailing from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace, and the next day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is the foremost city in that part of Macedonia, a colony, and we were staying in that city for some days. Now, I think, good. See what happens when I try to blow up a map? It's not your eyes, folks. It's the blurriness of the map, okay? But I wanted to zoom in so you didn't miss it because the big map covered a lot of ground. Um, verse 13 says, on the, on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside where prayer was customarily made, and we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. There it is. There's the story I'm telling you. They would have gone. Paul always went to the synagogue, but there was no synagogue in this town. So he goes, there's, where's the synagogue? There's no synagogue. Why not? Well, there's not 10 Jewish men in the town. Well, is there anything going on? Well, a bunch of the women, they meet down there by the river to pray. Where is it? And Paul showed up. Which, by the way, you think that the Bible is prejudiced against women. It was just the culture back then, but Paul wasn't prejudiced against women. Paul didn't go, well, it's just a bunch of women. I'll move on to the next city. Paul knew the women were, where the women were meeting, and he went. And so it, God isn't prejudiced against women, okay? Some people think, well, the Bible is just, uh, it's, it's, it's all chauvinistic. It's not. It's the culture it was written in. There was people who were really uh, prejudiced in various ways, but God isn't, okay? So, um, again, the rule of thumb. Not, not ten Jewish men, no synagogue. And so, here we go. Paul finds out where the women are, and he, and he meets these women. And in verse 14, it says, Now a certain woman named Lydia heard us. Heard us what? That means they're there preaching. 
That means they're, they're sharing the gospel. And, and she was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira and who worshiped God. And the Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken of by Paul. Now, it's just a little something that might help you along the way here is that it's, why would he even tell you, tell you she's a seller of purple? So what? That's right. The reason why they're telling you this is because in those days, if you're a seller of purple, you were a wealthy per person. <laughs> a wealthy purple. <laughs> you're a wealthy person because purple dye was very hard to come by and the, and the materials to put it together won't go into detail. It was quite costly and rare. And, and to be a seller of purple, it would be like saying, and she was a diamond dealer. You know, I mean, she was in touch with the rich and famous because only the rich or the famous or royalty wore purple in those days because of the high cost of purple. So it's kind of giving you a picture. Why would it say that? Because the first convert that Paul has in this city is a rich woman who really ends up being very helpful in helping them spread the gospel. And uh, <clears throat> rather than the needy man, you know, come and help us. The vision? I, and Okay, another theory of mine. This is just cr my crazy mind. Maybe if, if Paul had a vision of a woman saying, come and preach the gospel, maybe he would have thought <clears throat> it was the pizza, you know? Maybe he wouldn't have taken this serious. Maybe also, you know, if a guy has a dream about a woman, you're a little bit cautious, what was that, you know? I don't know. Maybe God knew what it took. He had to show him a needy man, and it took Paul to go down there to preach the gospel to his first convert in the area, which was a rich woman. Interesting. So, another thing, if you're taking notes, uh, don't miss how this woman was saved. It, was, it wasn't Paul's brilliant, persuasive preaching. The, the text says right there in the verses, the Lord opened her heart. The Lord opened her heart. And so, why do I bring that out? Is because the only way people get saved is the Lord opens their heart. Not because, well, I, I talked them into it. You talk them into it, they can be talked out of it, Right? If, you, if they're saved because, or they came to church because you talked them into it, they might not stay in church. But when the Lord opens their heart, that, that's something you've got to get, you've got to understand. Because if you're looking to bring someone to Christ, pray that the Lord opens their heart. Because you can argue to your blue in the face, and that doesn't mean anything. God changes the heart. Only God. You, you know, you could change someone's mind, but only God could change someone's heart. Okay? So... The Lord, Lord opened her heart, and, and it wasn't Paul's brilliant apologetic uh, skills, uh, like Jesus said in John 6, that no man comes to me unless the Father draws him. You're trying to witness to somebody? Pray to the Father. Say, God, draw them. Bring them to you. And, and then you, you just do your part. But man, if God doesn't do his part, we're in big trouble. Okay? Verse 15, reading on. And then she and her household were baptized, and she begged us, he says, us, Luke is with them now, saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us. There it is, us again. Um, this is an awesome provision of God for both parties. For Lydia and her family, they get saved to get to know Jesus. For Paul and his friends, a free stay at a resort. This woman had money. Mission trip isn't always bad. Mission trip isn't always rough. Sometimes you get to stay at a rich person's. I, I've been on all kinds of mission trips with dirt floors and with mansions. The Lord's got us people everywhere. It just depends. You know, sometimes God has some surprises for you along the way. But now we encounter that strange spirit I was telling you about in verse 16. Now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination met us, who brought her masters much profit by fortune-telling. This girl followed Paul and us, there's the us again with Luke, and cried out, saying, These men are the, are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. It's like, wait a minute, this is a demon talking, right? Was it true what, they're, what the demon's saying? This is why sometimes... Decept spirits can be deceptive. Sometimes they can be, there's a guilty by association or sometimes innocent by association. People might think, well, we know Paul and his team is legit. 
we know that Jesus is real. Here this, this spirit of this fortune teller girl was proclaiming and acknowledging this, then that must be good too, right? There's a danger there. It says that this she did for many days, but Paul greatly annoyed, and we're going to find out what happens next. Uh, but there's some things we immediately learn from this story. Some facts about spirit possession, if you're filling in the blanks. Number one, there is a such thing as demon possession, okay? It's not just Hollywood. It's not just movies. I personally, in the years I've pastored, I've got, got to. <laughs> I've encountered people who were demon-possessed. I've been parts of exorcisms and, and, and deliverance ministry to, get, to free people from demon, demonic spirits. It's real. You see it in the Bible, and it's not just something that they thought was real, but it, now, nowadays we know it's just mental illness. There are such things as demon possessions. Number two, spirit possession doesn't always appear evil. Sometimes it comes off as good. It may even try to, like we see in this text, it may try to align itself with Christians so that it looks good, good by association, like I said. And, and another thing is evil spirits may bring profit or pleasure. What? I thought evil spirits just make people suffer. No, Satan will do whatever he can to get you to align with him. I say profit or pleasure because I've known people who, uh, because of demonic attachments, the enemy blesses them. You know, you've heard of people signing a pact with the devil. You know, they usually make movies about it. A rock band that, that had to be heavy metal, right? Uh, that they, they signed a pact with the devil, and now the devil is blessing them. Well, to a degree, this is true. The devil will prosper you if that's what it takes to keep you on his team. But I say profit or pleasure because I've known people who because of their demonic involvement or because of playing with demons, they actually get certain pleasures out of it. Because there's children here, I'm not going to tell you the stories. But I'm telling you something, it's, it'll make the hair in the back of your neck raise up. Scary stories where the devil or, or the, the spirit will bring pleasure to people if they stay surrendered, submitted, and enslaved to those said spirits. It's serious. I've known people personally involved in this. We'll just leave it at that, okay? Now, uh, the next fill-in, and it's a little bit bigger one, is fortune-telling, okay? Now, some of you are going, wait a minute, I went to a fortune-teller at a carnival. It, it was fun. Some fortune-telling is, they're just, it's just, the, it's not even claiming to be real. It's just, give me a couple bucks, and I'll make something up for you, okay? But fortune-telling, let me re finish the line, if it's authentic, has its source in demonic spirits. If somebody could say to you, oh, I know about your life, yes? Your, your long-deceased grandfather is calling out to you, yes? He says, remember when I used to call you my little chubby bunny? Now, I hope that's not any of your nicknames, but... <laughs> Nobody could know that but my grandfather. He used to call me his chubby bunny. Where do you think he's getting that from? He's getting that from a demonic spirit. It's called a familiar spirit. Familiar spirits, by the way, and we're not, we don't have time to get into it today because we're going to have communion in a moment. Familiar spirits familiarize themselves with, with facts about your life or about your, your relatives or about your deceased relatives, and then they'll tell you things that will perk you up, and you go, wow, nobody could have known that but my dead grandfather. This must be real. Oh, it's real, all right. It's real demonic. You put a big, big X over it, and you stay far away from it. Um, so sometimes demonic spirits could even speak truth to you, but it's truth in order to deceive you and bring you in, in the wrong direction. Evil spirits possess supernatural insight. Again, I'm quoting from David Gusek way too much today, but let me quote one more. Today, much... Much of what fortune-telling and psychics do is only a money-making sham. But when it is true, it has supernatural origin, as opposed to clever, insightful guessing. There is no doubt that it is inspired by demons. And there are still those today who are possessed with a spirit of divination, because demons are created beings, not gods themselves. We suppose that they cannot read minds, nor actually foretell the future. But they can read and predict human behavior. And they can attempt to steer events towards previous predicted conclusions. Let me give you an example. Uh, 
Does the devil know what you're thinking? He can't read your mind. Okay? But he probably knows you well enough that he goes, I bet you, I, I bet you he's thinking this. Right? Or let me put it this way. If my wife can know what I'm thinking, the devil could probably have a good guess at it too. Okay? I mean, the, they just got to watch you well. Some of you guys are real predictable, by the way. Anyway, okay? Verse 18 goes on to say, and I started reading this. Uh, she did this for many days, but Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ, come out of her. And he came out of her that very hour. And I always used to wonder, why did Paul wait so long? Was Paul just thinking, oh, maybe this is somebody who knows who we are? I mean, she's not saying anything bad. Was it delayed discernment? Was it like Paul was just going, yeah, that's true. Listen to her. And then after a while, the Lord showed him that it was a demon. I... I don't know. It's another guess. You can have fun talking about in your small groups here. I don't know why it took so long. But the bottom line is, Paul did not appreciate demonic advertisements or demonic approval. You don't want a witch saying, oh yes, go to their church. It's a good church. Do you go to our church? You, know, you don't want the advertisement from the wrong people. Amen? You know what I'm talking about? So here's, here's one more fill-in. The big danger in this is that people could associate both spirits as equally acceptable. If this spirit and that spirit are saying the same thing, you might think they're on the same team. They're not. I've met people who are into spiritism and into New Age stuff, and they'll just say, oh yes, Jesus is, is the Messiah. Jesus is this and that. And they'll even agree with you to a point so that you could align yourself with them. Beware. Test the spirits. That's one of the things you're going to look at the verses and scriptures in your small group and go deeper with this. How do you test the spirits? And how do you know what's true? And so I like here in verse 18, by the way, which is as far as we're going today, that Paul's final solution was come out of her. You know, he did, a, he did an exorcism right then and there, and it didn't, didn't take long. <clears throat> so next time you go to a fortune teller, no, I'm just telling don't go to don't go to a fortune teller at all, okay? Uh, but I like... The fact that Paul didn't, didn't shrink back, he was intimidated, he wasn't threatened, he took authority and he commanded the spirit to depart. And I think, by the way, men in your homes, in your families, women for your children, mothers, watch over that which is yours and take authority over the evil one when he tries to creep in, no matter how, if it's TV shows, if it's movies, if it's video games, there's all kinds of ways the enemy is trying to creep in to our lives. We need to take authority and not be shy and just say, come out right now in Jesus' name. I take authority in Jesus' name. Husbands, dads, mothers, wives, grandparents, take authority over the evil one. Don't let him have foothold in your lives or in your kids' lives, or in your family. And the truth is that the Spirit of God and demonic spirits cannot coexist or partner together. And this incident will cause great conflict, as we'll look at next week. Because you think, well, that's a good thing, isn't it, that he cast out the demon? It is a good thing. But it wasn't a good thing for the, uh, this is a slave girl, for the owners of the slave girl. They were making money off of it. You know, by the way, that's another thing of the pleasure that you, you could make money. Well, I could make money by, by making a pact with the devil? She don't want to do it. Okay? So let me end with this. Have you been dabbling with the wrong spirits in any way? Let the Lord show you. And be open to change by what you're seeing in the Scripture today. Because dabbling with occultic realms can be very dangerous, can open you or your family up to spirit possession or spirit spirit oppression. There's layers depending on where you're at spiritually. You know, and, and can I just say, whether it's tarot cards, fortune telling, palm reading, even the horoscope, they all have roots in deceptive spirits. Now, I know I just got a bunch of you, get some of you upset. I'm just saying you pay attention what the Bible condones or what the Bible condemns and turn away from what the Bible tells you to turn away from. And uh, Darren, I've got all kinds of, oh, you're not there. Seth, is, Seth, you're doing PowerPoint and announcements? All right. I'm going to just read one more scripture, and this is from the New Living Translation, and then we're going to have communion. And 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, from the New Living Translation, don't team up with those who are unbelievers. 
How can righteousness be partnered with wickedness? How can light live with darkness? What harmony can there be between Christ and the devil? How can a believer be a partner with an unbeliever? And what union can there be between God's temple and idols? There's got to be clear lines in our lives, folks. For we are the temple of the living God. He's speaking about born-again Christians. As God said, I will live in them and walk among them. I will be their God, and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from among unbelievers and separate yourself from them. Now, here it's talking about unbelievers, but this especially applies to anything people are involved in the occult or spiritism. Therefore, come out from among the unbelievers and separate yourself from them, says the Lord. Don't touch their filthy things, and I will welcome you, and I will be your father, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. This is what God says to his people. And so really the heart-searching question to you as we prepare for communion, are there things that God's calling me to separate from? Are there people that I've been associating with? Entertainment that I've been embracing the, that the Lord says it's time to get rid of that in your life? I'm not going to give you a list. The Holy Spirit can speak clearly to you. But I know God's calling us to be a holy people. He's calling us to be his people, not his people and the devil's people. He's calling us to live holy unto him. Father, we bow before you and we just count on you to make clear what this text is to say personally to each one of us. As we prayed earlier, now we pray again, Lord. I know you've already stirred the hearts of some. I know you've already convicted some. And yet, Lord, we know uh, there's more than just conviction and and a, and a scathing call of repentance here, there's a promise. There's a promise that you say here that those who do that, we could have fellowship with you. That you say that they will be my people and I will be their God. Lord, I pray for special fellowship and communion to those who are wrestling with these issues right now, that they'd see the good, not just, not just the don't do's, but the benefits of following you. Lord, that we could be a people that we'd say, we are your people and you are our God. You are our Father. We are your sons and daughters. Lord, that's where it's at. And that's where we want to be. As I leave that to you to ponder before the Lord, we're going to have, go into a time of communion. And for those of you who are visiting and don't know how we do it, we've got three tables, two in the front, one in the back. And uh, as we worship the Lord, maybe you need to pray something through before you come up and get communion. Maybe you need to pray something, maybe repentance, maybe call in the name of the Lord. You make sure that before you come to get communion, you take care of what you need to take care of before God. But we have um, communion elements, and I like to do it this way because I want you to step out of your comfort zone and say, I'm, I'm, I'm standing up and I'm following Jesus, you know. The, the, the world before me, the cross, uh, behind me, the cross before me, I'm no turning back. I'm following Jesus. So it's your opportunity to get up and do something, to come and get the communion elements. Then you bring the communion back to your seat. And by the way, if you're visiting, <clears throat> it's a little complicated. We've got an all-in-one little uh, cup that you peel the first part open, and there's the communion wafer. You peel the second part open, and then there's the, the grape juice, and, and just... Maybe go back to your seat and pre prepare it. Open it and get ready and just wait for the further instruction. One more thing. If you are need gluten-free, we can help you too. Up to the front, there's a little container, a little plastic container, and the table in the front, right, you're right. And, um, and there's gluten-free if you need that. So right now, let's worship the Lord. You make sure you make right what you need to make right with the Lord. Grab the communion elements, bring them back to your seat, and ready them before the Lord, and then I'll give you further instruction as we take communion together. Let's worship Him. I'm forgiven Thank you, Father. because you were forsaken. I'm accepted. You were condemned. I'm alive and well. Your spirit. Accepted. You. 
Thank you, Jesus, that you died on the cross for our sins. Thank you, Jesus, that you rose again from the dead. As we hold these elements, we acknowledge that your body was broken for us. Your blood was shed for us. We acknowledge we need to partake of that sacrifice. And, and right now, let's just make that profession of faith as we've done many times. If you uh, don't know Jesus and you want to receive him as your Savior today, you pray this prayer with us. We're just making that profession of faith. If you want to come into the, the light out of the darkness, have your sins forgiven, be born again, uh, just join us as you make this profession with us. Father in heaven, thank you for sending Jesus. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I believe you died for my sins. I believe you rose again from the dead. Now fill me with your Holy Spirit. Cleanse me with your blood. Make me yours. As I confess you now, as the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Savior of my life. In Jesus' name, let's take the elements together. Praise your name, Lord God. Cleanse your people as you always do, Lord. Cleanse us from our sins. Make us fresh this morning. Make us new. Help us to walk in newness of life and walk in your spirit and not in our flesh. Hear our cry, Lord God. Make us to be your people, that we'd live that way, we'd act that way, we'd talk that way. In Jesus' name. Let's all stand, and we're going to close in one more... One more song. My wife reminded me to, to remind you. We got new pens. You're, you're welcome to take one. We got a whole table of them out there. It's not a sales pitch. They're free. And uh, just uh, Calvary Chapel Eagle pens. So if you even give them out to friends that are looking for a church, give them a, a pen and a, a direction. Okay. So uh, new pens out there on the table. Pick one out on the way out. And uh, there's all kinds of sign-up lists, ways you can get involved in the church, involved in ministry. It's all, our arms are open to you. Let the Lord use you. Let him fill you and use you, bless you and bless others through your life. Let's close with this song together.
bless you guys. Remember, if you need prayer, we have our prayer team up here.